Thank you, thank you. And first of all, Merry Christmas. This is our show before Christmas because, of course, next week we'll be celebrating the birth of our blessed Savior, Jesus. But we also want to give you a welcome to this special Christmas program for Scripture and Tradition. I'm going to break a little bit from our general pattern, what we've been doing on the book Saved, to focus in on the Christmas element about being saved. And this is a passage that a lot of people sort of glass over when they read it or hear it spoken. And it is the genealogy of Jesus in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. Now, this is one of those type of uh, uh, episodes in the Bible that are common. The Bible loves genealogies just loves them. And you see them throughout Genesis. In fact, if you look at Genesis, you'll see that there are 10 different places where it says, these are the generations. That was the earliest attempt to have chapters in the book of Genesis. That was the chapter heading. These are the generations. And then you see these lists of names. Now, most people find them boring to go through the list of names and don't know why they bother. But for the authors, they're very important. And if you get to be enough of a Bible geek, you even start to become fascinated with those lists of names. Now, we can't go through the other lists, but um, they are fascinating. They're not only in Genesis. We also see them in the book of Numbers, a little bit in Exodus 2, by the way. Uh, we see a good deal more of it in Chronicles and a few other places. It was very important to see that connection to the past. And... Again, just as a statement of a principle, uh, people today are beginning to regain an interest in their own genealogies. There are companies that do this, partly in thanks to the Church of Latter-day Saints, uh, the, the Mormons, who have gone around collecting birth certificates, baptismal certificates, marriage certificates, all sorts of information from Europe, and they've computerized it all. And now you have these genealogy companies that are drawing upon that incredible fund of information about genealogies. But in the ancient world, they didn't have computers except the ones on top of their shoulders. People would memorize the genealogies of their families, and they would pass it on to the next generation in order to induce their children, especially their sons, to go through that genealogy and be able to list it. Now, sometimes you do a genealogy to indicate your own importance. For instance, uh, my family uh, were, were, comes from families of peasants in Poland. And so the, the, it's in, of interest to know the people in the past, but I can't trace any of our family members to great nobles or lords and ladies or no, nothing like that. Uh, just fellow peasants. And in fact, some uh, time ago, we had the Grand Duchess of the Habsburg family, who would, if she were ruling in Austria, would be the Empress of Austria. And uh, my grandparents were born in the Austrian section of Poland, so she would have been my Empress, 
and I would have been one of her peasants. You know, that's the way that life was. But what, people don't care a whole lot. But if you are related to the Empress, the, em the, the Grand Duchess could give you her lineage pretty far back. And the various ways that she is connected to the different royal houses throughout Europe is part of her. And there are people from the Tsar's family and the uh, English royalty and all that. You focus on that kind of uh, information to show that you have a right to rule. In other words, people do genealogies with a purpose. Most Americans, it's a treasure hunt, <laughs> looking for somebody. Um, found at least uh, one murderer in my family, uh, but th there, are, I'm sure there's some others as, uh, as well, and all of us have sinners in our families. But the, you know, the Bible also gives genealogies with a purpose. They want to show something about our faith and indicate something about God's providence and what God is doing. So that's one of the things that we should expect to see when we are going through a genealogy. And that is in particular the case of the genealogies of Jesus Christ. There are two of them, one in Matthew chapter 1 and one in Luke chapter 3. And each has a slightly different purpose. As you notice in the uh, Gospel of St. Matthew, we'll see that it goes back to Abraham and David. But in the Gospel of Luke, which is pretty much oriented towards a Gentile audience, it goes back to the um, uh, uh, Adam and Eve. Why? Because he wants to show the connection of Jesus Christ to the whole of humanity. Well, St. Matthew who emphasizes the way Jesus fulfilled the covenant made to Abraham and the covenant made to David goes back to Abraham and David. So that's why there's an intention. And uh, you, you can be sure the genealogy, uh, the, neither genealogy by Matthew or Luke, really accounts for the whole of the history of humanity and the whole of the history of Israel. In other words, there seem to be a number of gaps. There aren't, not, there aren't quite enough people to cover the whole period of history that is in there. So that there seems to be a few uh, uh, folks who are missing and that's partly what explains some of the differences between them. So let's take a look, though, at St. Matthew, because during this Christmas season, we read from Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17 as a gospel. In fact, in the Maronite Rite, the Sunday before Christmas is called Genealogy Sunday, and we read through the genealogy. Where, uh, and in the Roman Rite, we also read it, usually on a weekday before Christmas. So let's take a look at it. It begins, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, the, um, oh, the Catholic edition calls it the uh, account of the genealogy. But the, the word in uh, Greek is biblos, so, it, it, you know, a book. You know, so, so that's uh, what he has there. And in that, we, we see that Jesus is called the Christ, uh, that which, which means the Messiah, and he's called the son of David and son of Abraham. That, those are two points. Now, he's going to make a third point in here because he's going to 
go through the genealogy from Abraham to David, David to the exile, and the exile in Babylon to the time of Jesus. And we'll see at the end that there are 14 generations in each of those three segments. So there's three groups of 14. And we'll talk about why the number 14 was so important. But we'll wait till we get to it at the end of the passage. He begins in verse 2 by talking about Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. All right, let's stop there for now. Something that a lot of people don't pay enough attention to is the incredible honesty and humility of the people of Israel. On one hand, they were very much aware that they are the chosen people. That means not just that they were, you know, the best people. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, the Lord speaks to Moses and says, you are not the biggest people or the greatest people. Or That's not why I chose you. They are chosen because God made a choice of them. And yet, though they're chosen people, they're also aware that they are sinners. They're well aware of their own failings. And they include in all these stories the history of the sins of their greatest heroes, including Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We, we have a shot here of uh, Abraham with his two sons, Jacob and Esau. And one of the things that we, uh, 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 excuse me, um, not Jacob, uh, Isaac and uh, his son Ishmael. Um, and one of the things here that we, we should keep in mind, when Abram was called, he was 75 years old, his wife was 65, and still a knockout, a knockout, great-looking woman. I mean, we, we have such women in our own culture who, in their uh, more senior citizen stages of life, are still absolutely gorgeous. Raquel Welch and, you know, all the people who were knockouts 50 years ago are still absolutely, Sophia Loren is another one, just stunningly beautiful in her maturity. And we see, for instance, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 11, there was a famine. So Abraham and the family went to Egypt and he said to Sarai, his wife, she was still called Sarai, which is the uh, old uh, language name for his wife, uh, meaning princess. I know that you are a woman beautiful to behold, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister that may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared. Now, he did this to Pharaoh. Involved his wife in lying about being his wife and saying he's a sister, and Pharaoh almost married her and got a plague as a result. And the same thing happened a second time in Genesis chapter 20, verse 2, when they go to the city of Gerar and they see the king, Abimelech, and Abraham said of Sarah, uh, she's my sister. So twice he lied about his wife, almost bringing about the terrible sin of adultery. Now this is also a family problem because we also see that Isaac did the same thing with his wife, Rebecca. And she, uh, he lied when he was living in Gerar and said, ah, oh, this is uh, my sister. So like father, like son, they both tell these lies that almost lead to the grave evil of 
uh, adultery, and the people almost married their wives, became ill because they got some plagues because of it. So that is also in there. And then we also see later in Genesis that the family tendency to tell lies appears with Jacob, who went to his father, Isaac, and, uh, and told him that he was his brother Esau. He even put on Esau's clothes, because Esau had a particular aroma. Uh, this is way before there's any deodorant. Okay, they, they don't have deodorant. And Esau smelled of the woods, or at least of somebody who lived out in the wilderness. So uh, they, they didn't even have the anti-scent products that hunters use today. He carried his own scent. And by wearing his brother Esau's clothes, his father came up to kiss him. And he could smell, ah, the smell is of my son Esau. And then he even took some goat hair and put it on his neck and on his arms because Jacob didn't have any hair on his arms. Sort of like me, he doesn't have any hair on his arms. But his brother was very hairy. So he put, uh, <laughs> he's as hairy as a goat. So he puts the goat hair on his uh, goat skin and is like, okay, yeah, it's hairy like Esau. As a matter of fact, the name Esau means to be covered in hair. It's hairy, not H-A-R-R-Y, as in from Harold, but H-A-I-R-Y, hairy, to be covered with hair. That's what Esau means. So he got, and he lies to his blind father. His father's blind, and he lies to him. And this is something that continues on to the next generation with Jacob's own uh, uh, sons, because on one hand, 11, or excuse me, 10 of his sons almost kill their brother Joseph. And then they put him into a well instead of killing him, because Reuben had a plot to get him out later. And then with the help of Judah, one of our Lord's ancestors, they said, why should we kill him for no reason? Let's sell our brother into slavery to the Ishmaelites. So Judah, who's an ancestor of Jesus, plots to sell his son. And then later on, Judah, you know, is, um, that's by the way, in Genesis chapter 37, verses 26 and uh, 27. After Judah marries a Canaanite woman and then marries his son off to another Canaanite woman named Tamar, which means a uh, uh, palm branch, then what you see, a palm tree, I should say, palm tree, uh, he's supposed to, the, the son dies, so he's supposed to give his younger sons, uh, the second one dies, so he's afraid to give the third one uh, lest he die. So Tamar, who is one of the women mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, one of the few women uh, mentioned in the, uh, only four mentioned, uh, and uh, in, she dresses as a prostitute and seduces her father-in-law Judah. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have any money on me. Uh, I'll give you a goat tomorrow. Well, she, thinking like somebody who knows business, uh, won't accept his word. She wants his credit card. What they would have are these round stones that they'd wear around their neck. And their name would be engraved backwards on the stone. And they would use that stone to roll over wet clay tablets. And they would, that's how they would put their name on it. That was like a credit card. So he gives her that. Turns out she's pregnant. He said, oh boy, we can kill the girl now because she's pregnant without being married. And then she comes to the trial and says, well, the daddy of my baby is the one who owns this, and it's Judah. So it's not only that she's a Canaanite, not only did she dress as a prostitute, 
But her father-in-law, Judah, our Lord's ancestor, is the father of Peretz, who is one of the twins she has, and that's another one of our Lord's ancestors. What we are seeing here is a family that is a mess. And we're not done yet. So we'll be back in a couple of minutes to go on through the genealogy of our Lord. Please stay with us. Right, we are back and we're going through the genealogy of Jesus our Lord. And we've gone through some of the folks that we know best from the book of Genesis. Now we get to a number of ancestors that we don't know too much about for a little while. So in verse 4, it's Ram, the father of, of Aminadab, Aminadab, the father of Nachshon, Nachshon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse. So before we, let's take a look at some of these, first of all. The characters we do know are, first of all, Rahab. Rahab, remember I mentioned how Tamar was a Canaanite woman who was an amateur prostitute that seduced her father-in-law. Rahab was a professional. She lived in Jericho. And when the spies came to Jericho, they stayed with her. Well, why? Because two strangers coming from out of town, staying at a house of prostitution, was kind of normal. Sort of like the old Western saloons where you had, you know, the, the girls dressed a little more scantily than most other 19th century women living in the saloon. Um, that, that's where you went to stay. Um, not nice, but this is reality. And, but they wouldn't be noticed. They'd be just a couple more Johns coming to the local prostitute. But she is not only a foreigner, a Canaanite from Jericho, but she's a prostitute and she's part of our Lord's genealogy. The second of the four women mentioned in the genealogy. And then it also mentions uh, Boaz. Now, Boaz came a few, there's a few generations missing there, uh, you know, because they, 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 he wasn't born right away. Uh, Boaz belongs to almost 200 years later. But it uh, goes on that he's the father of Obed by Ruth. Now, Ruth is the third woman. There's a whole book of Ruth in the Old Testament. It's a short book. I hope you read it. A lot of times, it's a wonderful book. But it tells that Ruth is from Moab, which is today in uh, south central uh, Jordan, uh, just to the east of the Dead Sea. And I've been to her hometown a number of times. And the problem with Ruth, though, well, she was very virtuous. So there, there is no problem of her personal virtue, but there is a problem in that she is from the country of Moab. This tribe of Moabites, like the Ammonites, were not supposed to be marrying into the people of Israel. Why? Because Lot got drunk. As a matter of fact, his, Lot's daughters got him drunk twice. And while he was inebriated, they each had relations with their father. And they each had a son. One is Ammon, the other is Moab. So that these people come from an incestuous union. And for that reason, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 23, it says, no Ammonite 
or Moabite shall enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation, none belonging to them shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever. But here we have one in Jesus' genealogy. This is, this is not easy. And by the matter of fact, I kept up because even in Nehemiah chapter 13, it, it said that no Ammonite or Moabite shall ever enter the assembly of God. Um, and so, uh, especially since they hired Balaam uh, to prophesy against Israel. So this is something there. And yet, this Moabite woman is the mother of Obed. Obed, her son, is the father of Jesse, and Jesse is the father of David. So they, King David's great-grandmother was a Moabite. You weren't supposed to marry them, but there they have it. And they deal with that fact, that they were disobedient, but they, they, it's there. And the great King David, in fact, that also explains why, for a little while, King David was hiding in Moab from King Saul. He probably had kinfolk over there, uh, cousins or something. Now we come to uh, Jesse. Jesse doesn't seem to do much. We don't know anything about his life in particular. Um, but we get to uh, David the king. We run into new problems. In general, David did well with God. However, there is one enormous failing. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, it says, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go forth to battle, David sent Joab, who was his nephew. Joab was the son of David's sister, Cheru Cheruiah, and his servants. And they ravaged the Ammonites, besieged Rabbah, which is now today the city of Ammon, Jordan. So they attacked there. You can still, if you go to Amman and go to the citadel, you can see the ruins of the walls from the time of David. It's still there. Really, it really is pretty cool. I, I love Jordan, great place. But David remained in Jerusalem. Now he's the king. He's supposed to be with the army, but he's staying at home. And when he was walking around on the roof, he saw from the roof a woman bathing. Now David's house was on a hill. So picture a steep hill. And you can, if you go to, is, to Jerusalem, you can see the steep hill of the ancient part of the city. And so David's palace was up above, as you always put king's palaces on top. And he's looking down at the roof, and there's a lady taking a bath. Now, instead of averting his eyes, which he should have done, and going back in his house, because that's not his wife, he keeps looking just a little too long. And he uh, calls for her, uh, finds out who she is, and somebody says, well, isn't this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now, she also may be a foreigner. She's married to a Hittite a foreigner, and she may be a foreigner. So that the um, fourth woman in, mentioned in the genealogy is another foreigner. You had, and that's one of the key elements of all four women in the genealogy. Tamar was a Canaanite. Rahab was a Canaanite. Ruth was a Moabite. And Bathsheba, married to a Hittite, was also uh, apparently a foreigner as well. And she was beautiful, and uh, she had been you know, purifying her, herself after her monthly time. And uh, she um, came to David. They had relations, and she conceived the child. In other words, David committed adultery. And then, you know, this is one of the problems with sin. A lot of people say, well, it's just sexual sin. It's not a big deal. It's just between two consenting adults. No, 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 no. Sin is social. She was married. And now she's got a baby. That adds to the society. And so she could be stoned to death, and so could David. David was liable to the death penalty for that. 
as was she. So to protect them both, she called for her husband, Uriah the Hittite, to come back and give a battle report. And he tried to get him to go home and sleep with his wife. But in Israelite law, in the book of Deuteronomy, a soldier at war may not have relations with a woman. He has to remain, you know, uh, abstain from that while he's in, in battle. And so Uriah is obeying one of the fine points of the law, and David is disobeying and breaking one of the top ten hit parade of God's favorite commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. So he tries to get Uriah drunk. He gets Uriah drunk and says, now go home and, let, you know, and be with your wife. And he still won't do it even drunk. When he's drunk, he's more righteous than David. So David sends him back with a message to Joab to let him get killed in battle. You know, arrange a death by having the soldiers withdraw when he's in the front line. And so he dies in battle. They, uh, Joab puts him near the wall, archers kill him, and Uriah dies. So now he's committed adultery and murder. How many times does that still go on? How many times do people try to cover up an affair by aborting the baby? Or we hear about you know, people having affairs and shooting each other and all this kind of thing. What adds to all this, when the prophet Nathan confronted David, David repented, but he still had to deal with the effects of his sin. And David had his moral authority in his family undercut. One of his sons rapes a half-sister. David had a bunch of wives. He was married to a number of women. And one of the sons from one wife raped a daughter from another wife. David couldn't do anything. He was a, a, an adulterer. And then the full brother, Absalom, of that daughter, Tamar, killed the brother that did the rape. How can David criticize Absalom? He was a murderer. He lost his moral authority. So this, is, and that leads to the, the problem in his family. Wait, we're not done. You go to Solomon. And King Solomon was wise beyond anybody else in the world. And he didn't commit adultery. But he didn't have a sensible marriage either. He married 700 wives and 300 concubines. Now, concubine is a legal relationship. It's a legal relationship. It means that you are legally in union with the man for whom you're a concubine, but it also establishes that your children don't have an inheritance. That would be the status. But it's not, you know, uh, you know, any form of prostitution, anything like that. It was a legal status within their ancient culture. Now, I, like most Christians throughout history, am a strong supporter of marriage. But Solomon overdid it. A thousand wives. You can't hardly know the name of a thousand wives. Now, why would they do this? Most of the time, it was for political purposes. A lot of modern people see that, well, they're just treating women like chattel. And there's an element of that, to be sure. But there's another element. It's also fathers giving their daughters a great responsibility to be live-in ambassadors that the daughters would represent their fathers and their countries and their tribes to the king. So one of David's, David's chief wife was the daughter of the pharaoh of Egypt, one of only about three Egyptian princesses who got married to foreigners. Egyptians didn't like their daughters to marry foreign kings because they were the children of gods. But Egypt was so weak and David was so strong that Pharaoh married his daughter off 
to, to David. But then, the, uh, to Solomon, I mean. There, and then you see that there are 999 other women. Now, this is a mess for another reason. Most of these women were foreigners and they worshiped other gods. So they would be representing their fathers. You know, they would, again, don't use too much imagination, but use some imagination to think about how a woman would be able to say, Solomon, for a very interesting evening, buy my father's sheep and goats. Or make this trade deal with my father sell us some of your wine, oil, and grain, etc. You know, th this was, that's why they did this. The women would represent their countries and the, they were ambassadors. And th this was where palace politics went on. So that's what's going on. But then they said, Solomon, I want to worship my goddess. I do, I'm not a part of the Israelites. So I don't want to worship your God. And he started making idols and temples and altars for the different gods and goddesses of his thousand wives and concubines. The hill where they, he did that is on the other side, of, just to the east side of the ancient part of Jerusalem. So not only did he overdo marriage to a great extreme for political purposes, but also for political purposes, he weakened on the issue of idolatry and committed this tremendous sin. And so as a result, as wise as Solomon had been, his son, Rehovah, was as much a fool. And that's part of his punishment. So Rehoboam becomes the next king. You see that in verse 7. And uh, in this, Rocha, the people of the north of the country came to Rehoboam to make a covenant with him and say, well, yeah, we'll take you as king. We'll accept you. But ease up the taxes and the forced labor, everybody had to work for one month for the government, building things. They were building cities, uh, places to store grain. They were uh, working on the temple, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, 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 so this, that's what they were doing. They said, ease up on that, and we'll readily accept you as king. The older counselors from Solomon, his father, said, listen to the people and give them a break. But his younger friends uh, said to him, uh, don't do that. They, they, um, your father made a heavy yoke, but do not lighten it for it. You say, my little finger is thicker than my father's loins. My father laid upon you a heavy yoke. I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. In other words, you think my father was tough? You haven't seen tough. I'm going to be tougher than that. Now, that kind of braggadocious, you know, uh, insistence that he's going to be this um, great, you know, powerful king, I'm going to force you to do what I want, led to a revolt. And the ten northern tribes split. They chose one of the captains named Jeroboam I to be their new king. There was a civil war, and it stayed that way until both kingdoms came to an end. This is where his folly led, led to. And then his son uh, that comes after him, Aviyam, also called Abia in uh, the Old Testament, you see uh, in 1 Kings 15 that he was evil. He reigned for three years. And um, uh, he walked in all the sins which his father, Rehoboam the fool, did before him. It doesn't say the word fool, but he was. that's my comment that he was a fool. So he walked in all the sins which his father did before him, and his heart was holy, not true, was not wholly true to the Lord, as was the heart of David. And um, only his son Asa, who came after that, mentioned in First Kings fifteen, he was right, and he got rid of male 
uh, cult prostitutes and idols, uh, and Queen Maacha, uh, his grandmother, because uh, she made uh, idols of Asherah, and he did that. But he didn't get rid of everything bad. So this is where we see the family get a little bit better, but there's still more downs to understand. So we'll come back in a couple minutes and can finish up this genealogy of Jesus. So please stay with us. We are now coming to the last few that we're going to deal with in terms of our Lord's ancestors. One of those ancestors is Uzziah, the father of Yotham. Um, Uzziah is mentioned, uh, his sin is mentioned in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 16 and following. Notice what it says about Uzziah. But when he was strong... He grew proud to his destruction, for he was false to the Lord his God and entered the temp temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. This was forbidden. Uzziah was the king, but he was still a layman. Only the priests could offer the incense he was not allowed into that area of the temple either, uh, even. The, you, this is a, a very serious sin of liturgical abuse, as we would say today. And a, a layman doing what only the priests could do. This happened every so often that people would try to take the role of the priest. Uh, you, you, uh, you see that um, in, back in the book of Numbers when some of the uh, people want to take over from Moses and Aaron, uh, take the priesthood from Aaron and spread it out to others. And then you also see uh, that when the, uh, the soldiers are bringing the Ark of the Covenant on an ox cart, one of the soldiers, it was almost falling, so he stopped it from falling. Well, he wasn't supposed to touch it. Only the priest was supposed to carry it. Wasn't even supposed to be on an ox cart. It was to be carried on two poles so that it wouldn't fall down and only priests could carry those poles. And they had to be covered with gold because the, the priests weren't even supposed to really touch the ark unless they absolutely had to. So, you know, they, you don't mess around with the sacred. This is something that's very important. In fact, in verse 17, the Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 priests who were men of valor. They, they were soldiers, soldier priests. And they withstood King Uzziah and told him that he can't do it. Only the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense, could do so. Leave the sanctuary, for you have done wrong. Now Uzziah was mad. You can't tell me what to do. I'm the king. I can do what I want. And... He, was, he had a sense he was going to start offering the incense and God struck him with leprosy. And he, had, and he became disgusted with himself. He had to leave the palace. Not only did he have to stay out of the temple because lepers were not allowed in the temple. Uh, you know, and we, by the way, with, we talk about leprosy. It's probably not Hansen's disease that we call leprosy today. It was some other skin disorder because they didn't have Hansen's disease in the Middle East at that point. That came a few hundred years later when Alexander the Great's army brought it from India. But they did have skin disorders. And 
so he had this skin disorder. He couldn't even stay in his own palace and he eventually died from it. Might have been a skin cancer or something like that. I'm not, nobody knows for sure. So that was what he did. And he, as I say he died uh, of his skin disorder. Then we also see mentioned, uh, he's the father of Yotam. His Yotam became the father of Ahaz. Uh, Ahaz. Now, Ahaz, what a bum. This guy uh, became king when he was only 20, and he ruled until he was 36. So only th uh, 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 16 years he was king. And he even burnt, this is in 2 Kings 16, verse 3, he even burned his son as an offering according to the abominable practices of the Gentiles. Now his son Hezekiah took over after him, and he was good. But then Hezekiah's son Manasseh was an evil guy, and he also burned his sons as a sacrifice in the valley of Gehenna, and that's what made Gehenna the place that was the symbol of, of damnation and hell. So, Go on. Now, most of the other people after this, we don't know as much about. Josiah came at later. He was a good king, but his sons were fools who destroyed the kingdom. And by revolting against the Babylonians and the Egyptians back and forth, and they got destroyed as a result. The other descendants we don't know much about. So, but, but it comes to uh, the, uh, Matan, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Joseph, uh, of the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. Now, Joseph is not the physical progenitor of Jesus. As a matter of fact, we'll see next how he doesn't know how she's pregnant. So he's not the father. Uh, but legally, he was. That's why we go through his genealogy, because his legal status is passed on to Jesus. And then it finally goes on here. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Why, why is 14 so important? If you take the Hebrew letter Dalet, the equivalent of D. That is also the number four in Hebrew. You take the Hebrew letter Vav, which is equivalent to our V. That is the sixth letter and is the number, the numeral six in Hebrew. Then you add Dalet again, the letter D, and you have the letter four. So D4, V6, and D4 add up to 14. The name David or David has the equivalent of the number 14. So by saying 14, 14, 14, it's emphasizing Jesus is the descendant of David. Now, one of the things that I want to explain, why have I talked about the sins of all these people? The meaning of our salvation in Jesus Christ is that he has entered into the history of human sin. And the genealogy brings out that he has entered into the sinful past of his own family, of the history of Israel. And he joined them in order to redeem them all the way to the past. In fact, if you take a look at 1 Peter 3, verses 19 and following, you'll see how Jesus went down to the prison and preached to all the souls of these people so that they could be saved out of that prison, or what we would call purgatory today. And in giving them a chance to get out of that, that prison of, of souls, he redeems them. But one of the things I like to bring out that relates to our Blessed Mother in this, you know, I'm from Chicago. And the Chicago River, it was our sewer system. 
all the sewers dumped raw sewage into the Chicago River. In the 1800s, up to the 1800s, the Chicago River flowed into Lake Michigan. Here's the problem. Lake Michigan is our drinking water in Chicago. So you're taking the raw sewage and pouring it into the lake from which you get your drinking water. That's why Chicago used to be known as Typhoid City. Even the man who debated Abraham Lincoln, uh, Douglas, uh, in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, died of typhoid in Chicago. So what did they do to fix this? Well, first thing, they had to reverse the flow of the river. They made the Chicago River flow backwards. They dug a canal down to a lower river, going towards Joliet. And when they came to the last point, they blew up the last bit of dirt, and the water of the river suddenly started to flow down that canal. And it went all the way down to the, uh, I think, the Illinois River and then to the Mississippi. So that pollution went that direction. And then they put a lock at the mouth of the Chicago River, where the lake now flowed into the Chicago River, they put a lock. This is a, a, a device, you see the gates opening and shutting, that the water from the lake can come in, and the river water doesn't go back into the lake. That's the idea of the lock. And boats can go in and out without the water constantly flowing from the river into the lake. So now we have uh, our drinking water is kept safe. And now they've actually cleaned up the Chicago River. The, uh, the Chicago River is no longer the sewer. We're not sending our pollution down to the down river anymore. Um, and they stopped all that. But think about this. That lock that lets the water of Lake Michigan flow into the river but the polluted river water not to flow into the lake. That is a wonderful symbol of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Being conceived without original sin, she is that lock into which Jesus enters. He is like that lake, but he's an infinite source of grace that flows into the stream of human sin and failure and corruption, and he brings that cleansing water, the water of holiness. He is that well of salvation that Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 12, and it comes into this polluted history and purifies it. And what we are doing here, as we recognize the importance of the Blessed Virgin Mary's role as that lock, and the necessity of Jesus to cleanse us. We want him to flow into us, and just as he's purified the history of Israel, we ask him to purify us and save us, so that as the angel told Joseph, he would be called Jesus, which means the Lord saves. And may this saving God bless you this Christmas season and every time of your life, the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have a safe and blessed Christmas. God bless you and thank you.